This time on the show, cyborgs! Is wearable computing a practical reality? Darren speaks with Greg Priest Dorman, a fellow geek who's been building and wearing the tech for the last 12 years. Plus, open source gaming that involves ponies. OMFG ponies. Oh, and Subversion 2. Source code ponies in cyborgs. Yes, all that and more this time on Hack 5. This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morris. It's your weekly dose of techno dust. Yes, it is. It's uh, season 11, episode 1, so... I'm uh, so excited! I haven't done the conversion on that nibble yet, but... We are going to be having a party... In 10 weeks. On what day? On May 3rd. May 3rd, which, which is, is a, a Thursday. Thursday. Why did we choose Thursday? Uh, because that was what was available at the Baltic, which ah. is an awesome German restaurant here in Point Richmond, where we can all drink beers out of boots yes. and have awesome Wiener Schnitzel and there is a and There is an open Facebook um, public event that I created a couple of days ago online, so you Sweet. can uh, you can find it there. We can put the link can in the show notes, Google I think. Plus? Do they do those yet? Um, I don't think they do events on Google+, Plus, but I can put you a link on there. Bright. Just, just show up. It's gonna be party. awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So RSVP for sure. We want to know how yeah, many. Yeah, we want to know uh, how many people are going. You know, hugs Shannon's gonna have to give out for free. Very true. Uh, yeah. How many <laughs> of the? Um, I have a quota. How many I of the postcards of her inside of the Yingling bottle as a mermaid? We're gonna have to have print. Have you seen those? Yes, those oh are great. Oh my god, those Paul, so funny. Can, you, can we throw those up? I just we're still a week behind, of course, as you guys know in our production schedule. So we're just starting to see these, and awesome. I love the Photoshop <laughs> contest. <laughs> I They're so embarrassing. Yes. So, so actually, which means tomorrow we should start seeing whatever it was, like the unicorn ones. I don't even remember. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Even snowboarding. more. Snowboarding. Yes, snowboarding. Guess what stuff. I saw the other week. Yes. So I was just chilling over there yep. in my little office area, my office space. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I heard this rustling out of the corner. Yeah. And I freaked because I thought it was like a cockroach. And yeah. I was like, great. We have a cockroach roach infestation what in happened? this office. Freak me out. I yelled at you. Yeah. Oh, so oh this I, thing. <laughs> I told Darren to come over. I was like, oh my god, there's a bug in my Cheez-Its. Go like attack it and kill it and make sure it dies. No, no, it was a mouse. And it wasn't it was PS2, it wasn't USB. It was, he was one like, of the like it was this big. He was so cute. He was so adorable. I seriously wanted to keep him and like take him home. No, we pet him. Get it. We have I, humane mouse would. traps on the way. I know. And then well, we can we, we can capture humane, them and it won't kill them. Can we so take they, them somewhere? Well, yeah, the idea is it catches the mouse and then you take it like a mile away and you drop it off. We'll find okay. like some nice well, French restaurants. Well, what if he's family? He's family like we'll living in the... catch the family too. Drop the family down at the French restaurant too. They can all be like Ratatouille and, and become Can chefs. we give them Cheez-Its or something? We'll give so them they have something to start... Backpacks weaponry. with weapons and Cheez-Its. Okay, cool. So they can go on adventures so can, with mouse We can't just drop them off like in Hunger Games, you know? No. No. What's that? We have to give them... Oh, it's the thing, and there's a new movie. Yeah, I, I so did see that. No, I haven't. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, we can't just leave them there with nothing. We have to give them. Like, I'm like food in a very and... PG movie kind of zone right now, so that yeah, one's probably cool. not for me. You might like Rapunzel. I saw. What was it called? called? Tangled. Tangled. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I saw that one. I don't know. They called it Tangled. I guess that's uh, cool. It's cool just where these I am days. Right now. Um, so hey, we don't have a gift from a fan this week. No, but we have a gift from Techzilla, and that is inspiration. I don't know if you guys watch Techzilla, but uh, here and there we like Techzilla. to check it out. It's a Are great you talking show. about your interview? No, no, the... I was actually just on with Veronica talking about all things from ShmooCon, and right. I even teased something about the Pineapple Mark IV. It should actually come as no surprise to anybody that we're working on the Pineapple Mark IV. We showed off some of it at ShmooCon. If you're not familiar, go and head over to thehackshop.com or hikshop.com. And, uh, and check it out. There's a bunch of like links to different interviews and stuff we've done about it. And it'll be up for public consumption. We'll actually awesome. talk about it more in depth here on the show very soon. Um, but the thing that caught my eye is because, you know, at ShmooCon and here recently, we've been... Is that a Pelican you know, case? This oh. is a Pelican case. Yeah. Not just any. This one is actually running a little battle pineapple with a... Uh, we got a 3G modem from Ting up in nice. here and battery pack and everything. And it's doing the whole attack. And I'm actually... If you look at right here, I've got ping replies going from it, so this thing is now, it online and active. Looks pretty snug. Well, it's it's pretty yeah. snug in there, and that's, that's the nice it's... thing about a pine or pelican case is I kind of feel like these are pretty hardcore. And as you guys know, Patrick ex just extols the virtues of pelican cases all the time. That's why I figured if Monica gets to do it. So do you. <laughs> so really? <laughs> yeah, here I'll take I'll take this from you. Ah! 
just because it's fun to smash stuff. And actually, I have no idea how this is going to respond. Beef. So, yeah, yeah. We'll see if we can keep getting ping replies. You know the lawyers downstairs that live down there. Oh, they're going to love this. <laughs> they're going to be so pissed Is it after five? Us. It is. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> oh, come on. Give it some. <laughs> oh, I opened it. <laughs> They've successfully opened it, but what's here? Let me snap it again. Ooh, can I try this side? <laughs> yeah, go. Okay. Oh, I got a dent in there. Nice. <laughs> I still have ping replies. <laughs> so <This is> fun. <laughs> that's fun. Anyway. It was probably a good idea to give Pull, me the hammer. Catch. Oh, fumble and, and I <laughs> still have ping replies. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. We should do that more often. Uh, no, actually what we need to do is get Patrick on here with a kilt and a sledgehammer. Oh my god, really? A kilt? I don't know. I would love to see Something that. Something I would like pay that. good money to see that. How about a cyborg? Would you like to see somebody wearing a computer? Maybe a CR-48? I would. Well, we have I love got, cyborgs. We have just the guest because we spoke with... Um, see a Cylon? We spoke with... No, he's not a, I, you know, I didn't ask him that. Hmm. I'm not sure if he's... Of the, so he's definitely a skin job, totally, but yeah, I'm pretty totally, sure he's not a Cylon. Anyway, totally a Cylon. <laughs> uh, Greg is going to talk about all of the awesome wearable computing stuff. He's been actually doing it like for real for the last 12 years, and that is awe-inspiring because I just know that I want like optical implants and stuff. I just want to be able to like, you know, have a pineapple in my back pocket and like be, like seeing log files go. Anyway, good stuff. That would be kind of awesome. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> That's just me. So uh, let's throw it to that and we'll see you on the other side for a little subversion and ponies. Ponies. It doesn't matter whether you're in the shower or hanging out with friends or showering with your friends. When a killer idea hits you, you need to snag your domain fast. And with domain.com simple search and checkout process, you're gonna have that domain in like no time. Plus, when you're ready to take the next step, domain.com has rock solid hosting infrastructure to create a perfect foundation for your project. And get this, the guys over at Domain.com, they're huge Hack5 fans. They want to hook you up, so they've got a coupon code just for us. It's HAK5 at checkout. Gets you 15% off. So when you think domains, think Domain.com. So Greg, what kind of cyberpunk term would you use to describe yourself? Are you a cyborg? <laughs> um, a lot of people use the term Borg, yeah. Um, I, I do body-worn computing or wearable computing. I, I wear my desktop. So I remember like pen computing and wearable computing and all, all these things were like fads for like a hot second. But I, And there's so many prototypes that never came to be. You seem to actually be implementing this. Um, yeah, uh, I remember at a conference in 97 I saw a 1200 by 1024 display, monochrome, but still, it was gorgeous. And they were running, as a system administrator, you know, it was like, they are running top on it, and you could see that in another window and all this stuff. And they said, oh, third quarter this year, third quarter 97. I since learned that third quarter means at least three years, probably not, you know. So a lot of stuff just never happened. Um, there are, and there are trade-offs you make. I mean, you know, I'm sitting here walking around, and there is so much cool stuff that's so much smaller and lighter than what I'm wearing. But before you actually try to put it together, you know. Um, so a number of years ago, it became worth it to me to start walking around in this stuff. And I just dealt with whatever I could get my hands on then. And um, most of what I'm currently wearing is, uh, well, it ranges from, what, about uh, 12 or more years old to five or six years old. So so you've been, so you've been wearing, so you, have you been rocking the wearable computing for 12 years? Um, in the late 70s, I was wearing not computers, but uh, biofeedback devices. By the mid 80s, I was building reading machines. Uh, I have a neurological impairment similar to dyslexia, and I got turned on to the idea of books on tape. And um, when the ability to take e-text and hear it came out, all of a sudden I could go from saying, I want to read this magazine article would you read it on tape and get it back to me in a couple of weeks? To, I want to read this magazine article and I can make that happen myself. And that was very powerful. But with e-text, I'd lost the ability to walk around and read. And when you're listening, it takes longer than if you're reading print. Um, so I wanted that functionality I had from a cassette player. 
uh, and I started building reading machines with laptops, uh, NEC Ultralight, I think, which was 13 pounds. No, that was the multi-speed, but anyway. Um, and game controllers to get me page up and page down so I could go back and forward in the text. When did it really become a computer, like a wearable computer? Uh, the first uh, gateway had something called the Handbook, which was a 486, about the size of a video cassette. I'm not going to bother describing what that looks like. Um, <laughs> I, know, I know what a video cassette and a 486 yeah. is. So that was, I think, 92. I got one of those. And I got a Deck Talk uh, 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 multi-voice, which was a hardware speech synthesizer. And with the two of them in a side satchel, um, started playing with cording keyboards for full input and was running a full Linux and then Slackware distribution um, and started doing all my work from that. So that was the first time it was a general purpose Linux box. It involved between 92 and by 94 I was actually wearing it as my... my and, and you say that the input then was just a QWERTY keyboard. No, it was a cording, cording keyboards. Oh, oh, oh I heard QWERTY keyboard. Oh, okay, okay. So has this uh, evolved a lot? Uh, what kind of the uh, what kind of input have you used over the years, and what do you prefer? I, I looked at a couple of different devices that were available then that you could get, and there were really two. Uh, there was something called the Twiddler, which is still available, and there is something called uh, the Bat keyboard from InfoGrip, which was a seven-button quarter based on a cording system that uh, they didn't develop that was out there. Um, there was a European system, but anyway. And looking at those two, um, I ended up opting for the BATS cording system. So this has evolved from that, but it's basically that. It's a seven button cording system, and it, it lets me do a full, anything you can do on a standard keyboard, you can do here, and then some. So how are you able to just use the regular ASCII keys on this? Okay, well, you're pressing groups of keys, turn it off, so you're pressing groups of keys at the same time. So if you notice, there are five, uh, five white keys and um, by pressing multiple keys at the same time, you can get 31 unique combinations of those five keys, two to the fifth. It's 32, that's, but that would include this, and you'd have to be doing a timing loop or something for that, so we don't do that. So 31 unique chords, like here's the letter A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay? So on these white keys alone, without moving your fingers to the right or the left or anything, you've got the whole alphabet, and you just have to memorize that. But you, how long, I must ask, how long did it take? It takes about an hour and a half uh, to memorize a coding system. Um, and to get good at it? To learn the alphabet. And I'm saying that because the, there's a military study from the mid-90s when they were looking at them. So they took a bunch of privates or whatever and said, here, try this, and you know, whatever. So an hour and a half is realistic. Um, and that's about 10 to 12 words a minute kind of range, maybe. After about a week, if you're using it, you'll, you'll be comfortable with it. After a couple weeks, you'll probably see yourself in the 20 to 30 word a minute, and then it goes up from there. But you, one nice thing about it is you never have to learn to look away from it. Because with one finger on one button to do the alphabet, you never, it doesn't help you to look at it and go, yeah, my finger's on its one button. Yeah, yeah. So, you never, so you can be here. Um, I made the app, my screen background in X, you know, I just put it up there. So, you know, I'm seeing the letter. For me, I'm hearing what I'm typing, and it, it was pretty fast. And then the, the cording sequence I use, most of your other stuff is then mnemonically based on the alphabet. So yeah, you have to memorize that this is the key for the letter P, but once you know it, by coming over here instead of the thumb, you get the punctuation mark. So here's a period. It's the same thing as a P, only over there an A, an apostrophe. Uh, uh. So, so only your thumb has to move to hit the function keys. Well, that's not the thing about it. It's that the, the punctuation is mnemonically linked to the letter of the alphabet it starts with. So once you learn the alphabet, you kind of get the punctuation for free. Once you learn the alphabet, you get your math symbols for free. You don't have to think, where the hell's a backslash? You go, oh, I do the B key with the number modifier, and I get a backslash. That's really cool. So what other uh, kinds of input do you use in addition to the chord? Um, over time, I've had lots of other devices hooked to this thing in terms of having it sense the world stuff. But, you know, day in, day out, I'm using this guy. Um, I use something called KeyNav, which is a standard Linux uh, 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 tool. I don't like using a mouse. Um, I very much believe in giving preference to human beings in the world around me. This is secondary, uh, as much as it looks primary in between us right now. So if I'm walking down the street and mousing, not only does it take eye-hand coordination, and I don't want to tie up two senses at once, but 
it's, uh, um, if I interrupt moving a mouse to say not walk into a bus, um, by the time I'm past the bus, the mouse will have probably moved from where I just put it. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want this to be the primary demand on my time. I want anything I'm doing here to be static that way. So I, KeyNav puts a grid on the screen. I use a three by three grid. So you press a key, you see uh, like a tic-tac-toe board. Then you press a key that corresponds to one of those nine boxes and you have a three by three grid in that box. So within two or three keystrokes, you're in a small enough place that if you now hit one of the mouse equivalents, you're selecting something. I don't remember what we were talking about before our uh, wonderful microphone died and we switched to a hack job using my, my Android phone, but uh, I think we were talking about input systems and, right. and the evolutions of them. Nav. Yeah, talking about key nav because you can uh, statically decide where to go. It's not time-based the way a mouse would be. I very much don't want to have to tie up two senses at once with oh. this. Right, so, but you're living in a GUI. You're not, like, in the command line all day. No, but that being said, I'm primarily in an Emacs window. So, um, I'm a command. Oh, oh, I see. No love for Nano? I'm joking. <laughs> um, so, the places I use, uh, now, but I, before Keynav, I used to script all my, like, wireless connectivity stuff. And I still do some of the Bluetooth stuff, because if, um, there's a certain amount of robustness with respect to wearable. When I turn it on, I wanted to make to make sure there's a way I can get into it if something doesn't work. So I wanted to say come up and register with a dynamic DNS service. So if for some reason the screen isn't on, I know I can get into the device and say is this the screen that's not working or something else, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so some stuff is still scripted, but I use like the standard net manager now because with KeyNav, I can very easily get over to the little icon. Um, and in fact, you end up learning it almost as a macro. You know, oh, right, right, because it's always, in that it's, it's an absolute spot. position. And so I hit three buttons and enter, and, and I'm now, I've got, got my, my choice is a wireless networks or something. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I really recommend KeyNav to anybody who, who is trying to use mouse alternatives. And it's so much better than you know, holding down the key and watching the mouse scroll across the screen. Um, so what about output? What do you use to, to actually, you know, obviously see and hear and, ner and interact with the computer? Currently, I'm using Attack Eye, which is from Musix, who's nice enough to be letting us sit in their booth while we record this thing. Um, it's an 800 by 600 display. However, it's it's not designed to be sitting out in front of glasses the way I use it. So I only actually get about 720 by 560 or something. Because oh, so you had to like calibrate it. It's a little far forward, so I don't quite see all the edges. So I just told the window manager that that's where to put the windows, and you know that's fine. And then I use audio out, and I either use a wired uh, headset. Uh, or Bluetooth headset. Uh, the problem is because the system is actually talking to me most of the time, if not all, as, as far as the headset is concerned, it's almost always on in talk mode. So, um, uh, so I need a headset that says I get 12 hours of talk time and to get 12 hours of actual use out of it. And have you actually found Bluetooth headsets yeah, that'll get one, you that? Um, this is a Plantronics I get 12 hours from. It's not, I like, there's a Jabra, I find the most comfortable, but I only get six hours. So I carry both of them, and then partway through the day I swap. That's pretty cool. So what kind of text-to-speech are you using, like festivals, some of the open source stuff? Um, I've used those. Uh, I'm actually using, uh, though, a, a commercial, you know, a, a for-purchase one, that it's what the uh, IBM Outloud evolved into uh, a number of years back. Um, but uh, it's a little more natural speech than uh, eSpeak or the stuff that's freely available for Linux. And do you do you crank up the speech rate? Um, yeah, but that's independent of this. I mean, uh, I, I uh, uh, do uh, pretty much all my reading in an audio environment due to my neurological impairment. So even before I encountered this system, I was using the Library of Congress recording for the blind into uh, uh, tapes, and there you you know you speed it up. Um, so depending on what I'm doing um, and uh, what type of text it is, I may be at five and a quarter words a minute, that kind of range. Um, but it's just like if you listen to a book in a car, you know you're going to want it slower than if you were listening to the book if you're driving the car. Listen to a book while you're sitting quietly on a couch. And for a while, I had some sensors so that it would change the speech rate and change the font size if I was like sitting down versus if I was walking around or that kind of thing. And I've played with that, but um, 
generally, uh, you know, fiction I'll take faster than code, you know, that kind of thing. It's, so what do you program in? Um, I'm a system administrator, so, you know, awk, uh, sed, <laughs> you know, um, bash, yeah. you know, that's, uh, that's the bread and butter for me. Um, so are you constantly connected with this, 3G, 4G, that kind of stuff? Um, I can be, if that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, a wearable is still very much a balancing act. You know, if you want to make something to do everything, then your trade-off is going to be a lot more battery and more power and that kind of thing. So it's always minimally, what do you need it to do? And then a couple things that are fun. Um, and the reality is I have enough stuff to do that I don't need. Well, you, you, make, you optimize it for what you do every day. At work, you know, at home, I've got connectivity. If I'm walking and I want connectivity, you know, I, I have, a, um, I until recently had a Verizon dongle and now I do it through tethering through the phone. You know, that's easy enough to do. But here at CES, that's only working in a flaky way, but it's not essential for me, so I didn't try to, you know, make something redundant to deal with it before I got here. Okay, so now, as far as the computer is concerned, what are the biggest challenges been in, in conjunction to getting that to, like, you know, last through the day? Um, again, a balancing act between what you needed to do. For me, uh, I mean, in the mid-'70s, I was using Pentium 166 boards uh, that you could get through the in, uh, these things called PC-104, which is an embedded standard. They're about four-inch square boards you can buy. And you can get all sorts of combinations of stuff on there. Um, and then it went for a while. It was a Transmeta uh, Caruso, uh, or via Eden at about 800 megahertz. Um, for me, I've always, ever since I got down to about five to six watts an hour, I haven't wanted to go back over that. So for me, that's the mark I shoot for. So, so what CPU are you rocking now then? Currently, it's a dual core Atom. Um, and I'd like to move uh, to one of the X scale type things, but there are some pro I can't get the speech output I want yet there. So I've been playing with it, but I'm not using it. For but you'd like to move to ARM? Yeah, uh, just to get down in power, because down in power reduces weight. So every time I've improved the device, I've either kept the same power consumption, but gone up in, in computational power, or basically stayed at the same computational power, but gone down in power consumption. So at this point, um, I really like, and I would highly recommend Battery Geeks as a supplier. Uh, I'm wearing one of their batteries. Um, I used to build my own battery packs, and then for a while we used the Sony camcorder batteries with a standard. They were a little block that looked like, like if you taped eight AA cells yeah, together, yeah. right? Um, but Battery Geeks makes all different packs for different things, and it's just not nicer not having to roll it yourself. So I get about 14 hours using this normally, or about 10 to 12 hours if I start trying to run the camera and do other sensors and stuff at the same time. And, and what, so what does the uh, pack weigh at that point? Um, well, this guy is just under a pound, and the 14-hour battery that's on this side is about a pound and a half. There's an 8-hour battery that's just under a pound. So ideally, I'll wear the... Um, I've had some back problems independent of this, uh, and so I like having the exact same weight on both sides. But for the conference, I'm wearing, you know, the longer, larger battery. But you can see it's not, uh, it's pretty light, you know, if you feel that, that's, you know, there's oh, yeah. not much there. And when it's strapped on this way, you know, you really don't feel it much. And it's, so. and it's not like a full netbook or something, because you don't need a keyboard and a display well, and all it, those this things. This actually was a netbook. Um, Until the Dremel I, came out. This, this was a, a Chromebook, uh, a dual-core Chromebook uh, that, that was uh, given to me to play with. So, you know, free is always good. Um, and it happened to be one where the, internally it was made up of two smaller boards. So rather than a single board, you never know until you open it up. So this is the boards from the inside of a Chromebook with nothing else. No, the battery was this big L-shaped thing, so that didn't work. Yeah. And the screen and the keyboard come off, and you're left with something that weighs under a pound. Um, I also it had a, a, a cellular modem of some kind in one of the PCIe slots, and I didn't want to deal with that, so I unplugged it. But getting better speech for Linux on the ARM platform because that's the one hole that's preventing me from moving to say just rooting a phone and using that. I don't. I don't really want to go to using eSpeak as my primary. Speech. I was about to say, if you like, if if you were say a kid watching now and you're yeah. intrigued by this and want to get into this, and you've got, oh, you just upgraded your tablet or you have a spare older, sure. you know, Android phone or something yeah. like that. H how would you get into this? What would you be using? Yeah. Well, the, for the first number of years, I didn't use a display. I didn't use this as a display. I only used audio for a display, and 
And the thing is, it's always trade-offs. If you want to start experiencing walking around and using your computer more than the stop and take it out mode that you do with your phone or people did with their, you know, uh, their Palm Pilots, um, and it it really changes what you do with it and how you do with it when you when it's just always there and always with you. So I encourage you to do that. Audio is the easiest way to do that. Audio output because you can use eSpeak. Uh, uh, as an audio output and Emacs speak uh, uh, as an editor which also has basic web browsing and um, I live inside something called org mode which is a notes taking mode that integrates well with the calendar and with all these other functions to let you jot down ideas quickly and you know you have an idea about something else you just throw it in there and it saves it separately so you can do that with um, with a netbook uh, and most netbooks you know they're getting into the four to six hour range I guess with battery life if the screen is off, because the screen's still eating the most power, so you close the lid and all of a sudden you've got six hours of battery life, um, then, and you can do a, just a, a headset, a netbook, and and some sort of input system. And that's where you either build it yourself or buy it. There's a few different things available. That's so cool. So uh, as far as like the wearable computing um, scene is, where, where can people like go and see what other people are doing and get um, inspiration? I, and I'm not really, sh I'm not really sure what where the hot spots are now. As I say, I'm just kind of doing this every day for me. Um, there used to be groups that I participated in and could tell you about, but I'm not sure what's out there now. Uh, I would say, you know, do a search and, and take a look and, and make sure that where you're looking for advice, there are people who are actually doing it rather than one of the problems with the lists in the past was you would get, for every one person who actually was doing it, you'd have 100 people who were, well, as soon as somebody makes a display high enough resolution, I'm going to do this, and all they were doing was dreaming about it fact is, you know, take a netbook, take a tablet, rig up some kind of input system for yourself, either buy a Twiddler uh, or, or make a quarter, um, and we can talk about where you can go to do that, um, and just start using it. It will change what you think you want to do with it. And um, and a couple weeks of actually using it is, is a lot better than a whole bunch of years of waiting for somebody to build the thing you need that isn't there yet. So At least for me it was. So I would strongly encourage people for a couple hundred bucks, you know, grab an old tablet or grab a netbook and just start playing with trying to keep it on all day. That'll present its own challenges with battery life and with stripping away functionality to get better battery life and figure out what you can get away with for input. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Those are very inspiring words.